the temple is, uh, first of all, it's the largest congregation, largest Jewish synagogue uh, in the state of Georgia. Uh, and it's the oldest in Atlanta. So we are about to celebrate our 150th anniversary. We were founded in 1867. Over the course of 150 years, both the rabbis of the temple and the members uh, have really made a lasting contribution in the city. Each of the rabbis who have preceded me have done something unique and extraordinary. Rabbi Jacob Rothschild arrived in Atlanta in 1946. He had been a chaplain in World War II. He had grown up in Pittsburgh and he was not aware of Jim Crow. He saw it for the first time when he got off the train in 1946. I grew up in the temple, and uh, when Rabbi Rothschild came here to be our rabbi in 1946, we met and very soon got married. He was not at all like what most people think of as a clergyman. He loved to have fun, he had a great sense of humor, loved sports, we went horseback riding together. The temple, when he came here, had 400 members. Within a very few years, it had over a thousand. This was a community in which, when the youth group met, mothers might bring in ham sandwiches for their snacks. People were not lighting candles. People were not getting married under the canopy, under the chuppah. People were not having bar and bat mitzvahs. That was the world Rabbi Rothschild entered. He began by introducing a few aspects of Jewish observance. He lit Friday night candles, he introduced a few words of Hebrew, he installed bar and bat mitzvahs, and he asked the mothers to please stop bringing ham sandwiches. I was a little kid, we had an ice storm, as we had at times in Atlanta. I saw a little puppy outside. My dad loved dogs, so I bring the puppy in. So the housekeeper calls dad and says, your son wants to bring this dirty dog into the whatever. And I get a call from him on the phone or the phone gets handed to me and you support your staff. And he says, get that dirty mutt out of me. I could not understand it, it was not like him. Next scene, dad comes home. He comes walking over to me in a quandary. How could you let this little puppy stay out there in the cold? I reminded him of our conversation. He looked at me completely quizzically and said, why did you listen to me? Couldn't you see that I was wrong? He had an inner sense of right and wrong. So many of his sermons were about civil rights. Uh, at the time, they were somewhat controversial. Uh, people today like to look back and think it was all heroic, but at the time it was controversial. People were sometimes upset that the rabbi was always giving sermons about civil rights and really pushing the congregation uh, to move in a direction. He was one of the first to, uh, to speak out against racial segregation. In those days, the, the saying, we need to do this, but we have to do it slowly and gradually, that was a code word for not doing it at all. I'm talking about the need for really doing it and doing it gradually, and that was what he stood for. We realized that, that there could be danger, but we didn't think about it consciously. Three thirty-seven a.m., October 12, 1958. Fifty sticks of dynamite in the middle of the night blew apart the side wall of the temple, Atlanta's oldest and richest synagogue which stood in pillared, domed majesty on a grassy hill above Peachtree Street. The brick walls flapped upward like sheets on a line. Offices and Sunday school classrooms burst out of the building. The stairwell came unmoored and hung like a rope ladder. I've heard from countless members of the congregation who tell me from miles away they heard the bomb, that just on a quiet night, um, in, in the fall of 1958, um, the bomb was so loud that people heard it and literally jumped up out of bed. 
I was sitting upright in bed, still in shock, and he was running back and forth getting shaved and dressed. And when I realized that my children were awake and had heard their father and me uh, yelling actually back and forth, it was the day before my daughter's 11th birthday. My son was almost 10. Then I realized that I had to be a mother and remembered that when you want people to not be frightened in a tense situation, you put them to work. I said, go out each of you on your bicycles and you go in one direction, you go in the other and stop at everybody's home that, that you know that has children in the Sunday school and tell them not to be afraid, but that, that there's no Sunday school today. And so um, a friend later told me that she answered her doorbell at about 8.30 that morning and looked down and there was Paul Revere on his bicycle. It was a tremendous act of domestic terrorism. There was this terrifying moment for the Jewish community about whether the attack would be denounced by the city's white Christian elite. It was instantly denounced by the African American elite who was experiencing similar attacks all across the country. But would the power structure of white Atlanta take notice? Atlanta has always been a lighthouse of racial and religious tolerance in the South. And we are shocked and amazed that this awful thing could happen in our midst. And we prefer to believe that it is the work of people outside of our city. We have brought every resource of law enforcement to bear. We have offered rewards, and we hope that the perpetrators of this thing will be apprehended. But my friends, here you see the end result of bigotry and intolerance. But Atlanta immediately, the leadership said, not here, and there was solidarity. Rabbi Rothschild felt defiant, and he put on the, on the announcement board out front on the yard, he put uh, words from the Torah, and none shall make them afraid. This is approximately where the bomb was set off. Rabbi Rothschild was very proud of the fact that nothing was missed except religious school that particular day. There was no way to know what to expect that Friday night. Would people stay away out of fear? Everyone turned out and packed the sanctuary like it had never been packed before. It was like the most popular ever Rosh Hashanah. They all came. The rabbi uh, stepped up on the podium and looked out on this packed sanctuary and fell into a bit of his Pittsburgh sense of humor and said, oh, so this is what it takes to get you to come to services. We believe that uh, the bomb went off uh, accidentally at the wrong time. It went off uh, early, early, early in the morning, well before the students were in the building. So nobody was actually in the building when the bomb went off. Uh, it would have been catastrophic if, if the bomb exploded when, when people were, were, were here in the building. Dad was bringing me to Sunday school. We got word on the radio that the four little girls in Birmingham had been blown up in, in the church bombing. I could see it on Dad's face that that's when he realized that he could be speaking from that pulpit behind me and somebody could murder congregants because of it. And that's when I recognized that you know, this is unspeakable. I hope people will get an idea of how bad things can be. When we look down on, on each other, when we feel that uh, somebody else doesn't have the same rights or shouldn't have the same rights that we have. Personally, the most important thing that I would like people to get out of it is to, uh, to have some feeling for my dad. Didn't get that acclaim or applause or eclat in the late 60s and 70s and 80s because of what he had done in the 40s and 50s. Because by the early 70s he was dead, so I'm happy that people remember him because he deserves it. The Temple bombing is uh, going to be a really important play for our city, 
uh, for our community. And we really hope that, that after it, uh, the debut here in Atlanta, that the Temple bombing will travel across the country, that, that, that hundreds and thousands of people will get to learn the story of what happened to the Temple in 1958. But we particularly want people to understand this story because of what's happening in the world today because there is so much bigotry and hatred, anti-Semitism, homophobia. Uh, we want people to understand uh, what can happen uh, if the community doesn't stand up uh, against hatred and bigotry.